Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Ready to get back in our Father's Word. Chapter 32, verse 1, the great book of Isaiah. Yahweh's salvation. That's the way you find it, is through our Father. We're, we're tangled up in these uh, woe situations, and um, we're, we're almost through them. But all of a sudden here in chapter 32, God tells us about a king you can appreciate. He tells us about someone you can appreciate. Um, so let's just, without further ado, a word of wisdom from our Father. Like a breath of fresh air, let's get into 32, verse 1. It reads, Behold, or you look here, not woe, but look here. A king shall reign in righteousness, and princes shall rule in judgment. Boy, what a change that would be. Total doing what's right, even and the underlings of that king, they're doing exactly what's right. And um, naturally, you know who that king is. It's Jesus Christ, King of kings, Lord of lords. His underlings are his elect. Verse 2, And a man shall be as an hiding place from the wind, and a covert from the tempest, as rivers of water in a dry place, as the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. In other words, you know who this man is, don't you? That man is Christ, of course. He is our covert. You know, you have to think of this as being in the desert in one of those old desert sandstorms that just, I mean, it just blisters your face to be out there, that you have him to stand behind. You always have Christ to stand behind. You have, when Christ is with you, you are protected from all things. And even providing the living water. Naturally, what is this great rock, this heavy rock in the Hebrew? It's Christ. He is our rock. Verse 3. And the eyes of them that see shall not be dim. And the ears of them that hear shall hearken. They're going to have eyes to see and ears to hear. Finally, at last, many more, perhaps, even than God's elect, will be able to see the truth because it will be directly before them in this King of Kings. Verse 4. The heart also of the rash, or, or the hasty, shall understand knowledge. What a change. And the tongue of the stammerers shall be ready to speak plainly. That, that's eloquently. Uh, when, when is that going to be? Well, when is it that we don't do the talking and the Holy Spirit speaks for us? That's God's elect as they're delivered up before the spurious Messiah. The Holy Spirit speaks through them as it is written in Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21, as well as many other places. That speech eloquently shall go forward, a truth. And the people that hear it, as a matter of fact, Luke 21 goes a little bit further. It states that even the gainsayers will be convinced by what you say, for it is not you that speak, but the Holy Spirit. Verse 5, to continue. The vile person shall be no more called liberal. I don't, I, I, you know, liberal has changed its values until uh, what it means in the Hebrew is noble. And I'm going to read it that way. Liberal has taken on kind of a communistic, socialistic trend. And I don't even like to use the word. Uh, having fought against communism up north, I lost a lot of good buddies to liberalism. And so naturally, I'm not real fond of it, so I'm going to translate it as it should be translated, noble. The vile person shall be no more called no noble, nor the curl, that's to say the miser, 
said to be bountiful. In other words, um, a person that's covetous is not going to be able to be called um, bountiful. Uh, verse 6, for the vile person, that's Nabal, that, that uh, 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 person shall speak villainy, and his heart will work iniquity to practice hypocrisy and to utter error, that's to say lies, against the Lord, to make empty the soul of the hungry. And he will cause the drink of the thirsty to fail. That's, that's what Satan is good for, you know, is, is to take that away that God blesses with. Now, what have the last few chapters been about? Don't leave God out of the equation of your life. He furnishes blessings. If you follow the vile person, if you follow the curl, uh, you're going to end up without God's blessings, and you're going to thirst big time. Okay, You're going to do without big time. When, when this particular time rolls around, verse 7, the instruments also of the curl are evil. I mean, he dreams up evil things and he brings it to pass. Those instruments can be uh, contracts, uh, they can be loan agreements of usury, they can be uh, covenants made with nations. He deviseth wicked devices to destroy the poor with lying words. Even when the needy speaketh right, even when the needy are doing what's right and trying their best, he's going to rip them off. He's going to do his best to rip them off. Now, um, an evil person, a vile person, follows the vile one, the vile one that is identified as the vile person of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. And uh, that vile person, of course, is Satan himself, his ilk, and those that follow him. Verse 8, but the noble deviseth noble things. In other words, somebody that's really noble brings forth devi uh, um, uh, noble things. And by noble things shall he stand. He stands for good. And um, why? Because God will bless him. That's the way it is. You don't have to worry about it. He doesn't have to beg. And uh, God provides for those that do what's right, especially at this time that we're reading of here. You don't have to wait for heaven to stand behind Christ in the storm of the end times. You can stand behind him now. He's there. He's there for you, and his promises are sure. You can count on it. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Verse 9, rise up, you women that are at ease. Hear my voice, you careless daughters. Give ear unto my uh, speech. Th this is, um, careless daughters is used uh, well, those that would practice self-confidence, and it's said in irony. To get up, do something, but do it right. Okay. Verse 10, many days and years shall ye be troubled, ye, care, you careless women, for the vintage shall fail, the gathering shall not come. In other words, you're not going to be blessed. And, and um, that's just the way it happens. Without God's blessings, everything you touch, Everything you do ends up just about with naught. You may get by, but that's all you'll do is just get by in a poor way when you could be blessed for bringing God into your equation, for standing in the storm behind this king, which is to say Messiah, which is to say Christ, to allow him to protect you, to be your covert, that is to say to protect you from everything. That isn't to say that you can't cut it, because you can. With his help, the storm doesn't bother you. Bring it on. Can-do type people. Why? 
they serve God and God is in their life and God blesses. 11, tremble you women. This is symbolic of Israel that doesn't believe in a way or isn't following. Tremble you women that are at ease. Be troubled, you careless ones. Strip ye and make you bare and gird sackcloth upon your loins. In other words, um, you're going to have a sad old time of it. Now, you're supposed to be doing something is what God, I hope you get the point here. You're supposed to be bringing God into the equation of your life. You're supposed to be talking to Him, consulting Him, consulting His letter, whereby He can, where He'll have a reason to bless you. If you don't give God a reason to bless you, I, you rest assured, He won't. You won't have to worry about it. He said, you might as well get set up. You're, you're, in for, you're in for a sad, old, miserable time for many years without that king, without Christ. Verse 12, they shall lament for the teeth, for the pleasant fields, for the fruitful vine. This is that you hire uh, people to beat their breast when there's sorrow and, and shame. So said, you're, you're going to have to, and that is masculine. You're going to have to do a lot of hiring, for you're going to have a lot of sorrow, a lot of grief to bear. Verse 13, upon the land of my people shall come up thorns and briars, yea, upon all the houses of joy in the joyous city. All those happy homes are not going to have any happiness there. They're going to fall apart. Why? Why? They're not consulting God. One of the chapters prior, running off down to Egypt for protection, protecting in armies, uh, uh, gaining protection or feeling protected by armies, by mortal men, and leaving God out of the equation. God is promising you, you better get ready for some sackcloth because your happy home is not going to be happy any longer. This means he's going to tighten the screws a little bit. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Thorns and briars make one of the hottest fires there is. They don't amount to too much and it doesn't last long, but boy, they sure make a hot fire. And this joyous city, of course, is what? It's Jerusalem. That when, after the Antichrist sets foot there. Verse 14, because the palaces shall be forsaken, that's neglected, the multitude of the city shall be left, the forts and towers, that's even the tower of Opal, if you would, shall be for dens forever, a joy for wild asses, a pasture of flocks. For, for that period of, of neglect, it's going to go downhill to where it isn't fit for anything. Do you understand why? You should. Because not this king that we started with in this chapter, but the false king is going to stand there, and it's nothing but downhill and neglect after that. Standing in the holy place as it is written in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, claiming to be God, standing on the mountain of God, it's going downhill all right. A place for wild asses. You can count on it. Verse 15. Until the Spirit be poured upon us from on high. Oh, what Spirit is that? The Holy Spirit, of course. And the wilderness be a fruitful field, and the fruitful field be counted for a forest. Th this loses a little bit in the translation what this is saying in is that when that spirit comes from down on high, what we call a garden that produces now, we're going we're to throw that away because he's produced much better in where the forest was. Reclamation, reclaiming, making beautiful, not, not neglected, but loved and tended. Because why? Because the Spirit came, comes down from on high. But, beloved, let me ask you something. Think about this equation. When does that Spirit come down from on high? 
Well, let me see. It came down from on high 40 days after Christ was crucified and then a 10 day wait and that Holy Spirit came down from on high on the 50th day called Pentecost to give us an example of exactly how it would be. What, what am I saying? I'm saying even now if you believe and if you get behind the, the uh, Messiah, <clears throat> this King, that that Holy Spirit is still with you. It's already here. It's already here from on high to bless what you do when you follow Him and when you love Him. <clears throat> and even what we call fruitful now will be put to shame in a way by what is produced at that time, by what our Heavenly Father does for us. What I'm telling you is something much better is coming. Verse 16. Then judgment shall dwell in the wilderness, and righteousness with re, righteousness remain in the faithful fruitful field everywhere. Why? Because God God is in control. Is there any wonder why you should consult with Him? Is it any wonder why that you should take Him into the equation of your life? Because He blesses, and He's showing you here. The, the proceeds or the profits of his blessing is plentiful. Everything. 17. And the work of righteousness shall be peace. Not just calling it peace, but real peace. And the effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. My, what a time to live. What a place to be. It's to be with our Father. And then just a little caution and a little reminder, He can be with you today. All you have to do is ask. All you have to do is receive. Verse 18, And my people shall dwell in a peaceable habitation. They will have a happy home. And in sure dwellings and in quiet Resting places. Resting is Sabbathing. What a Sabbath that's going to be. What a hab high Sabbath. Because that king, that king that we read of in verse 1, becomes our Passover, where anything wicked must pass over us. What a blessing and what a time to be. <clears throat> now, I want to say a word about this 19th verse. I feel that it belongs after the 14th verse. It's kind of out of order, but that's fine. I can read it that way and we'll leave it stay. But what we're going to do, the Assyrian is being punished and we're going to revert back now to this, not this happy place, but back to the sadness that we had fall at, during verse 14. We read 19 and you make your own mind up and uh, I, I feel as a teacher I owe it to you to tell you though. Verse 19 reads, When it shall hail, coming down on the forest, and the city shall be low in a low place. Now, this is not the place we were just talking about Jerusalem reclaimed. This is Nineveh, the city of the Assyrian, that type of false Christ. And again, uh, that verse belongs after following 14 before these good blessings begin. But be that as it may, we can leave it there and it'll fly, fly just fine as long as you understand what city we're talking about. Nineveh and its destruction. Why? Because it took advantage. God used it as a rod and it overdid what God would ask it to do. Now, back to the restitution. Okay, verse 20. Blessed are ye that sow beside all waters that send forth thither the feet of the ox and the ass. What, what blessed translates happy. <clears throat> but do you understand? Don't read over that. You know, many people are couch potatoes or they go to a church where they're just a pew potato. They never do anything. They, um, and what did it say here? It said, blessed are 
are ye that sow beside all waters. They're doing something. They're sowing truth. They're living it. They're participating in it. And naturally, that's, they um, send forth, uh, they're working the very soil itself with the feet of the ox and the ants. Uh, uh, and, and it means, in a way, they're ranging free and sowing and doing God's work. So that's what you need to do. Do you want his blessings? If you really want to be super blessed, that's what you do. You share the truth. You, you protect your credibility. I'm not telling you to go out on some corner and shout to the high heavens. That, that would be idiocy and you would be called an idiot. And no one listens to an idiot. Okay. So when an opportunity prevails, plant that seed. And how your father loves you for that. Because you're doing something. You're sowing, you're sowing seed to all beside all waters. That means sow it where you know it's going to produce because it will be watered. That's, that's why you pick and choose and feel free for free pasture, free grazing rights. Free feeding rights to the truth of Almighty God. What a beautiful chapter. This chapter 32. Providing that prince and the king. The princes, I should say, and the king. Being God's elect and the Messiah himself. And the sowings of seeds of truth. That bring joy and happiness. And contentment to a very troubled world. A troubled world where the storm is brewing and the east wind is blowing. The blistering heat is building. But with Christ, you're protected. Let it come. We know, we know from prophecy the end times are kind of tough times for those that are not with him and behind that rock and on that rock. And that rock is Messiah. What a beautiful chapter and what a beautiful message. Chapter 33 and verse 1. Here we come to the fifth of the six woes. Listen to it. Woe to thee that spoileth. Uh, do you know who the old spoiler is? That's one of Satan's names. And of course it has to do with the Assyrian, that type. Uh, and, um, and, and so it is. And thou wast not... Uh, Woe to thee that spoilest, and thou was not, and thou was not spoiled, and dealest treacherously. And they dwelt not treacherously with thee. When thou shalt cease to spoil, thou shalt be spoiled, and when thou shalt make an end to deal treacherously. Thou shalt deal treacherously, they shall deal treacherously with thee. This is, uh, old Snacharub was the, the uh, type for this, the king of Assyria. And he did deal treacherously, but God, God let him correct the people, but God doesn't like it when people touch his children. So what he's saying is when it's over with that old spoiler, there's a special place for him. You know what it is called. It's the abyss, the pit. That's where ultimately this, this being the type, but the real thing, being Satan himself, is going into that abyss for the millennium. His spoiling days will be over with for a while. Okay. Verse 2, O Lord, be gracious unto us. We have waited for thee. Be thou their arm every morning, our salvation also in the time of trouble. In other words, um, um, not their arm, but our arm. Be there for us. Be strong for us. Um, and it's important that you know what was said there, and that you don't let it slip away from you. We have waited for thee. They're not those hasty ones we read about in a prior chapter that falls off to the first Messiah that comes along. They wait for the true Father, there's going to be a wedding, and he expects virgins for that wedding. We're speaking spiritually. 
people that were not deceived by the spoiler, people that were not deceived by the Apollyon, which is to say the uh, he who does destroy, which is uh, the adversary, which is to say Satan. We wait for the true Father. Verse 3, At the noise of the tumult, the people fled. At the lifting up of thyself, the nations were scattered. In other words, um, when, when the enemy was coming, um, the people did scatter. Verse 4, And your spoil shall be gathered like the gathering of the caterpillar, as the running to and fro of locust, shall he run upon them. Um, he's going to strip the Assyrian army. They're going to be spoiled. And just as the, um, uh, just as his children um, and the locust army stripped Israel, he's going to get stripped. His time is coming. Verse 5, the Lord is exalted. For he dwelleth on high. He hath filled Zion with judgment and righteousness. Jerusalem is going to receive that justice and righteousness. Ultimately, what will be right will be right, and what is wrong will be tagged and labeled wrong. Verse 6, listen carefully now. Wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times. What gives you stability? Don't read over that, beloved. I'll ask it again. What gives you stability? Wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times and strength of salvation. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. The reverence of Almighty God is your treasure. Why? Because it brings forth the knowledge. To begin, as it is written in the Proverbs, uh, Proverbs 1, verse 7, reverencing the Lord, the word is fear or revere. Revering the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and wisdom. And that's your stability. That gives you stability in all in the storm, in the time of trouble. It gives you stability when things are rough. Why? Because he's with you. And, and you are sowing his seed in the right places by the water. Not out where it's never going to have an opportunity, but where it should be, in fertile ground. And your loving him is a treasure because it brings great dividends. Seven, behold thy valiant, valiant ones shall cry without. The ambassadors of peace shall weep bitterly. Um, when Sennacherib, Sennacherib was coming, the Assyrian, they sent out ambassadors. He kind of laughed at them. Okay. He, payday comes. What goes around comes around. And I'm speaking historically now. Uh, he really made light of them. He was going to conquer. He, he could care less about peace. Uh, he was going to conquer. Verse 8. The highways lie waste. The wayfaring man ceaseth. Uh, um, that, that's just, you might say the mortal flesh ceaseth. Uh, he has broken the covenant. He hath despised the cities. He regardeth no man. That, we're talking about the Assyrian. They'll cry peace, peace, peace. They'll send ambassadors, but there will be no peace. Now, I want you to understand this real good because prophetically, what does it mean? We're going to do road maps. We're going to do try for peace. We're going to shoot for it and everything. But do you think that the Antichrist is going to be dealt with? Do you think you're going to talk him out of it and he's going to say, well, let us just have peace and let the Lord come? And there's no way. He's going to stand in the holy place claiming to be God. It doesn't matter how many ambassadors you send. It doesn't matter how much you beg, how much you plead, or what you do, or what kind of covenant you might want. There is no way 
that you can talk the Antichrist out of doing what he's going to do. And this type was the same way. Couldn't phase him. You could cry peace, peace, peace all you wanted to, but there would be no peace. Verse 9, the earth mourneth and languisheth. Lebanon is a shame and hewn down. Sharon, that, that, that's the plain where it's good fertile ground. It's like a wilderness. And Bashan, that's the fruitful place. And Carmel, um, that's the fragrant fruitful place. Shake off their fruits. In other words, um, um, uh, it, it, um, before it's time, it withereth, doesn't produce. And, and the old great cedars of Lebanon, which is symbolic of our people, they're going to mourn all right when that one comes. You really, what you're reading is a type of the Assyrian that would come, and he is the type of Antichrist that would come in the end times. You'll remember back in the 14th chapter of this great book of Isaiah, I told you to mark old Lucifer, son of the morning, which means the bright morning star. Because Lucifer claims to be the morning star, just like Christ does. In other words, he's a fake. He's an imitator. That the Assyrian in that 14th chapter is set up. You with companion Bibles, it will draw it out for you and explain it as a type of Antichrist. But you're covering it here. And um, there will be no dealing with him. Verse 10. Now will I rise, saith the Lord. Now. Will I be exalted? Now will I lift up myself? That time will come. Verse 11, you shall conceive chaff. You shall burn, bring forth stubble. Your breath as fire shall devour you. I, I, want, I want you to get that picture. Our, our father has a very direct way of putting things. He said, you're going to be impregnated all right being with the false Christ. And you're with what? You're, you're going to conceive chaff and you're going to bring forth stubble and your own breath is a burning fire, meaning you're going to burn yourself up. And that's how much sense it makes for someone to follow false teaching. You destroy yourself. I'll say it again. You conceive chaff, you bring forth or give birth to stubble, that's grass, and your own breath is a burning fire, and you destroy yourself. That's how much sense it makes, friend, to follow this false one, to be misled by traditions of men rather than following the true God. Don't miss the next lecture. Bless your heart, you listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13 verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are. Get back again. The 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. Hey, that number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. If the spirit moves and you got a question, share it. Please never ask a question about a particular individual, reverend, denomination, or organization. Let's don't judge people. You know, having a father like we have, we don't have to judge. Boy, he does it. He judges right down to the wire, and he's good at it. Why? That's why we can call him judge. That's why we don't need to judge someone. He does it. All we do 
is plant that seed, that's the Word of God, and let the chips fall wherever they may. That, and that's as it is, so it is, so be it. Those of you that listen by shortwave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you. Your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Again, always a pleasure. Now, got a prayer request? We can do away with the number and the address. Why? God knows what you're thinking. He's your father. He's the nearest relative you've got. He created your very soul. He brought it into being. And, and he loves you. He may not love what you're doing all the time, but he does love you. And he wants you to return that love. That's what he wants from you, is love. Uh, Hosea 6.6 6 documents that. Don't want your burnt offerings. I want your grace, your mercy, your love. Father, around the globe we come and we do love you, Father. And we ask your leading, leading guiding, and your direction and your touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and question time. And we got, I got two of them here. Uh, Greg from New Hampshire, when Satan comes, will we be able to kill him? No, no, no. You know, when, when you say the word kill, when, when Satan comes, we're closing the door. He has a job to do. And it's to, to deceive those that have not studied God's letter. That's, that's working a work. And do you know something? Sometimes you have to let people go to the devil before they can be saved. Sometimes you have, they have to see for themselves how far they can sink and be deceived. And then in the millennium, maybe finally learn the truth. Just as the scripture said today, they would have eyes to see and ears to hear. And they would gain knowledge and they would gain wisdom. That can happen if they want to love the Father instead of the wicked one. So, uh, but God has duties for him. His death and his, uh, as a matter of fact, you must begin to think of death as death of the soul when you're that close to the millennium. Because then only God can bring the second death to pass. And you read of it in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. Fear not he who can kill the flesh body, but he who can destroy both the flesh and cause the soul, your mortal soul, to perish. That means disintegrate, be blotted out, gone. That's our Heavenly Father. So only God can kill at that time. I understand I'm talking about spiritual bodies. It is already written. Satan's death is already written. You can read of it in Ezekiel 28, verses 18 and 19. Robert from Alabama, who is the author of the Companion Bible? Well, well God is, of course, our Heavenly Father. And naturally, there were the prophets. He that assembled it, not the author, but he that assembled it, is Dr. Bullinger. Dr. Bullinger was one of the only Christians that was proficient enough in Greek, Aramaic, and Hebrew to be a proofreader to the Masara when, when, Chris, um, when it was being assembled. The only Christian that was good enough that he came forth and was asked and did uh, proofread a great deal of the Masara. And that's a great help. And it's worked into the Companion Bible in points where it's really important. And um, so uh, he, was, he was a great scholar. And um, he, he did not know everything, but... He had a great, he was way, he passed away in the year of our Lord, 1915. But his knowledge preceding that time, if he had lived to see the events that have transpired since 1915, we've gone to the moon. We have seen Israel become a nation. We have seen uh, two world wars and many other skirmishes. To see the end times uh, 
consummating or coming that, that coming to this place that we now call the last days. And still he was that good with putting things together. What makes his work so good is he outlines. And until you learn to outline, you don't really know for sure who the they's and the them's and we and, and who it's talking about. And unless you can get into the languages, he helps you with that. And that, that, makes, that makes his work just fantastic. Vincent from Texas, would you please translate exactly what, what was being said in the scripture and lead us not into temptation? The exact translation is adversity. Lead us not into adversity. Um, and I, I, might, uh, I might add to that 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. Um, uh, and it kind of answers that question. If you still have a question about it, I'll repeat. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. Uh, Caroline from Maryland, why is there a Gideon Bible in every hotel room? Well, because the Gideons is a, a organization that feels it's important to sow the word in places where wayfaring and traveling people are, that they have a Bible at hand. How much good does it do? Well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm certainly not going to judge their work. Uh, the Bible is there, and... Um, uh, it may be many times that the first time somebody's been able to pick one up, did not have access, did not have a Bible. And uh, they see to it that they are placed there when people have time to, to sometimes to busy themselves with. Sandy from Missouri. I have a friend whose faith has been very strong for many years. Her house burned to the ground and now she is struggling with her faith. She wants to know why God let that happen. I don't know what to tell her. Well, I, I not knowing what caused the fire, you can't blame that on God. Careless wiring, carelessness in the kitchen with grease or something else that burned the house down, uh, poor workmanship somewhere in a wall. You're gonna blame, she's gonna blame God for that. Then she's, she's in a heap of hurt. You know, um, and and um, we have to take care of business. We have to keep things uh, as best we can. But things happen. And um, uh, Sandy, you might uh, you might read for her Jeremiah chapter twenty three, beginning with down with the verse that says, "Don't ever say what kind of burden did God put on us today, because God doesn't put burdens on us, and it makes Him angry when somebody says they do, that He does." So she needs to read that and absorb it. She's treading on dangerous soil. Jeffrey from Connecticut. Where in the Bible does it say we should not eat pork? Leviticus chapter 11 of the swine you shall not eat. Why? It's a scavenger. It has no sweat glands and it stores all the poison it partakes of uh, in its fat. Richard from Kentucky. I accidentally shot someone and they died. Can I still be accepted into the kingdom of heaven? I've repented over and over, but I still can't get it out of my mind. Well, Deuteronomy chapter 19. What happens if you go to cut wood with somebody and they the axe, the flange fly from the handle and strike somebody and kill them. It's an accident, okay? And, and there, there, is, there is no sin there against God. So you're, you're punishing yourself. I, I can imagine how you feel, okay? Um, it is one thing to take the life of an enemy. It's something else to take the life of an innocent person. And I, I can imagine how you would feel. But at the same time, God does not hold that against you, okay? I might advise reading Deuteronomy 19, but that does not cover the part that lie and wait and take a life, okay? Mark from Florida. Who are the elect and the very elect? Well, I'm going to take the easy way out and say read Revelation chapter 7. The 144,000 are the elect and the very elect are the 7,000 of Romans chapter 11. David from North Carolina. I'm trying to prove to a friend that the dinosaurs were in the first earth age. 
what scriptures can I show them to prove this? Well, you know, uh, I'll give you the scripture first, but you can go to many. I'm thinking of um, ne the Nebraska University's museum. I'm thinking of Colorado, the museum, the state museum. You have um, dinosaurs right there in the lobby of Arizona. Uh, there are dinosaur remains, fossils, in, in many major universities. They're there, so what do we do about it? And well, when, when were they there? What's well, in the first Earth age? But you can, you probably your best scripture is Job chapter 40, where it speaks of the behemoth. The behemoth is a perfect description of a dinosaur, not by name, but by definition, as the dinosaur is explained. In other words, it eats from the tops of the mountains, and uh, it was a grazer. Um, and many of them were. The Rex, dinosaur Rex, many of them were carnivores. Uh, but uh, that would help you. And then you must go into the fact that there was a first earth age. That's probably what they're worrying about is the fact that there was one. And if you have a companion Bible, Appendix 146 will help you with that. Or my work on the three earth ages. Uh, Lisa from North Carolina, what right does a preacher have to tell certain people not to come to his church? Well, you're putting me in a tough spot not knowing anything concerning it, but naturally, a shepherd of the flock, if there is a wolf trying to come and destroy sheep, the shepherd must prevent the wolf. In other words, if someone is really causing trouble, if someone is uh, taking advantage of the sheep, the children of God, then the pastor has, the, it, you take quite a bit upon yourself when you do that. Because you're turning away somebody that certainly needs help in a way. But the decision must be made which is more important to let someone come in and destroy, hoping they will change, or how it could affect the life of those wanting to do what's right and not asking for the trouble. So uh, the pastor must weigh that out and answer to God for it. But um, I'm not going to allow someone to come into my congregation and, and um, cause problems that would uh, take away from God's word. Uh, a shepherd has that right. But uh, again, if it were for personal reasons, that would be very wrong. If a pastor just dislikes someone, he has no, and they're not causing any problems in the church, I would hate to be in his shoes if he forbid someone to come. Okay, it's one of those things. God is judge. Cynthia from North Carolina. Where in the Bible can I read about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Daniel chapter three. The three Hebrew children is what they're usually known as that were cast into the fiery furnace and Christ was in that furnace with them, protecting them from the heat, from the blast. And to the point he protected them and was their covert in that furnace until you, they had no singe on them when they came forth. It made a believer out of Nebuchadnezzar just about. It sure helped along that way for Chapter 4 of that same book is written by Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, in one of the most beautiful prayers in God's Word. You'll find in that chapter, written by none other than that particular, not the king of Babylon of the end times, but Nebuchadnezzar. Joseph from Michigan. How can you tell when you have fallen from grace? Well, you're going to feel it pretty well from the Father. But it's really quite simple. It's when you sin and don't repent for it. When you sin, you transgress God's law and you're going to fall out of grace. But Christ paid the price on the cross that once you're saved, then 
all you have to do is repent. That, that's a twofold thing. That is to be sorry you did what you did and to tell God you apologize for it and you want his forgiveness. That's what repentance is about. And you're back in grace again. And, and many might say, well, I sinned so much. Well, how many times did Christ say you had to forgive? 490 times a day, seven times 70. Uh, if a person really is sincere and means it. So there's no excuse for staying out of grace. Once you fall out of grace, simply repent and get back in grace. Donald from South Carolina. In the millennium, when Satan is in the pit, Will his spirit be here on earth to tempt us? Absolutely not. When I, it is my opinion that it is Michael that will incarcerate Satan in the pit. And the ban that is placed upon him is a very strange ban because it prohibits him from doing anything, meaning even spiritually. He is totally, completely banded to where he has no influence whatsoever on anyone for that thousand year period until he's released that short season. It's going to be a lot easier to teach during that time. Number one, people are going to be in spiritual bodies. They won't have the flesh begging them, to, uh, leading them into sin. And, and uh, two, they will have Christ right before them. And many other reasons. It's going to be real simple to teach at that time. And one that doesn't overcome. No second chances here. Don't try to ride that into this. With what's being taught in the world today, there's not all that many people have a chance. But they'll get one. Carol from Oregon. I have a minister that writes to me and tells me that God spoke to him and I'm supposed to send money to his church to prove my faith and receive blessings from God. I don't believe this. Well, you're fortunate because I wouldn't either. And do you know something else? God wouldn't believe it because God, didn't, God does not send beggars and God does not send letters begging. And anyone that says he does is a liar because that goes against God's scripture. And um, that's just the way it is. We, you got a lot of, you were reading about them today. You got a lot of sham artists that'll say God said this and God didn't say a word to them. They're fakes. And um, uh, God said, when you go to teach my word, don't take a begging bag. And he meant it. So, you're very wise. Unfortunately, many senior citizens get ripped off by artists like that, knowing they're approaching death, perhaps, and they want to be in good standing with God, and this man is saying, God spoke to me about you. That's intimidating to someone that is not, that doesn't know a fake when they see one. God would never, ever, ever. If, if God wants to tell you something, He's got your telephone number. If God wants to speak to you, he knows where you live. He even knows what you're thinking. He won't send somebody else to deliver a message to you other than maybe like the word of God, just teaching it. But if God himself has a personal message for you, he will deliver it himself. Terry from Michigan, is it okay to get remarried? Uh, divorce is not the unpardonable sin. Uh, I know that upsets some preachers, but let them get upset. The beauty of Christianity is that God forgives and God loves us. And when one repents, I have to believe Christ forgives or I wouldn't be teaching him. I could not teach someone that promised salvation or forgiveness and then never would get around to doing it. He, he goes to the point of saying once you repent, I don't want to hear it again, he says. Don't bring it up to me again. It's gone. And that's the way he does business. I like it. That's why I teach him. Tammy from North Carolina. Is water baptism necessary for salvation? What was Christ showed us the way. 
was Christ water baptized? Answer, of course he was. Well, then if Christ was baptized in water, certainly uh, you're better than Christ? No, you should be ba water baptized also. Um, yet at the same time, Water baptism symbolizes that you publicly make the statement that you are a believer and that you believe Christ went into the tomb and that he resurrected. He came out of that tomb. He lives. And that's what the statement is about. And once you believe that statement, like Christ would say to the thief on the cross who was converted during the execution, said, this day I will see you in paradise. He was not water baptized. Uh, Vernell from Florida. Will those that didn't accept Christ in this earth age, will they be changed at the end of this earth age and go through the millennium? Good, bad, ugly, sinners, saints, at the last trump, all, all are changed into spiritual bodies, but a lot of them still have mortal souls rather than immortal souls. Those that uh, go, have, participate in the first resurrection are raised with an immortal soul. Otherwise, those that don't accept still have a mortal soul. They will be taught in the millennium if they had no opportunity to learn. I'm out of time. Hey, I love you all because you enjoy studying our Father's Word chapter by chapter, verse by verse. But most of all, God loves you for it. it hey, it makes His day. And when you make his day, he's going to make yours. It pleases him when you bring him into the equation of your life. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, bless God. He will always bless you. Now, most important, hey, you stay in his word every day in his word, even with trouble. It's still a good day. Do you know why? Because Jesus is the living word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.